passes, does it? But that some new work or study or biography or something comes out about Lawrence of Arabia, T. Lawrence. This year is no exception. There's already been at least one book. We in the BBC are putting out a big 60-minute documentary, and they've just finished making a big feature film, mainly in Spain, which is going to be called Lawrence of Arabia. It's this film that we're particularly interested in tonight, or rather, it's the actor, Peter O'Toole, who plays the central character, Lawrence himself. The uh, story of Lawrence in Arabia is, for all its compulsion, simple enough in its broad outlines. He got to the Middle East in 1909 after reading history at Oxford and then turning to archaeology. And it was, in fact, archaeology that first drew him to the desert that he was to make so much his own. Lawrence spent four years in the desert working on various excavations and completing a survey of the unknown wilderness of Sinai. When the First World War broke out, he joined the intelligence service in Cairo, but after two years escaped from officialdom and went back into the desert to organize and inspire the Arab revolt against the Turks. His mission was to unite the Arabs into an effective striking force. It took time and it took diplomacy. And the Arabs, it seems, grew to trust and admire him. Lawrence had his reward with the first major success of his campaign when he descended from the hills and took Aqaba, a town vital to his supply routes. This is Aqaba, as Lawrence saw it, as he moved into the attack in 1917. But the sea is not the Persian Gulf. This is Aqaba rebuilt in 1962 in Spain on the shores of the Mediterranean. The main body of the town has been reconstructed from photographs to provide one three-minute sequence in this Lawrence film. It stands an incongruous ghost town on the Costa del Sol, impressive from the west, a mere shell of plaster and wooden framework from the east. Lawrence, once he'd secured his supply routes from the sea, could start on the main part of his campaign. He moved out with his Arab forces into the heart of the desert. And there he began the constant harassing of the Turkish railway which ran from north to south right through Arabia. His aim was not to break the railway entirely, but to tie up so many Turks in its defence that he could run circles round them elsewhere. The scene being filmed here is the capture of a trainload of Turkish horses. this, Lawrence believed passionately in the Arab cause for its own sake. He was a leader of the Arabs, and he wanted victory for them, not just for the Allied cause at large. The film of Lawrence of Arabia retells this story of his Arab campaign, and tells it, of course, with all the panache and paraphernalia that one expects from a film epic. Most of it was made in the desert that Lawrence fought over, but other sequences were shot for one reason or another in the sand dunes of southern Spain. They took out 200 Spanish horses every day into the sand dunes to join a pair of Turkish railway trains, 1917 vintage, running on two miles of specially laid track. And to ride the horses, and to represent both Arabs and Turks, they hired 400 Spanish extras. <laughs> David Lean, the director. The film unit had their headquarters in the town of Almeria. One of the local villas was the home of the man at the centre of the film, Peter O'Toole, who plays Lawrence of Arabia. O'Toole is 29. Up to now, he's been working mainly in the theatre, and this is his first big film part. He made his name on the stage, in The Long, The Short and The Tall in London, and in performances in Shakespeare at Stratford-on-Avon. And it was O'Toole that we'd come to see. He's a tall, reckless, Yorkshire Irish, doesn't give a damn kind of man, and it seemed hardly an obvious choice for Lawrence, a withdrawn, tightly reined in man of five foot six. On the other hand, O'Toole wasn't an obvious choice for Hamlet, which he played with the Bristol Old Vic, and still less for Shylock, in which he gave a tremendous performance two seasons ago at Stratford. In fact, not being an obvious choice, 
seems to be part of the stock in trade of this undoubtedly extremely gifted young actor. We wanted to know what his approach had been to Lawrence, which of the many interpretations he'd adopted. He talked with Kenneth Griffith, the actor, and a friend of O'Toole's on the balcony of his Al Maria villa. I hate to be fine, particularly when I'm working on a character, because I am, um, I find this uh, embalms him, and he becomes an immortel rather than a, a living thing. Um, I came to it by a great deal of research, the study, but without any conscious, I mean, I, I'm taking the task a lot about this, that I should synthesize, but I won't, and I can't. Um, I'll give an example of how I came to it. Uh, I remember um, sitting in a black tent in a place called El Jaffa, and we were talking about Lawrence to a lot of Arabs. And someone said, oh, Abdi would know better. And they shouted for this man. And in clanked a huge Sudanese gentleman of about 80. And he was a slave, an, a now freed slave, whom uh, Abu Dabutai, who was one of Lawrence's chief warriors, gave to Lawrence to look after him. And he, someone said, what did Lawrence look like? He pointed at me and said, him. Well, needless to say, we, I grabbed him and we talked and talked and talked. He, he worked on the picture. He made the coffee, in fact. And uh, one day I was playing a scene. And he said, um, I was um, talking to someone and being rather remote and looking all over the place. And he said, a battle, a hero doesn't look here or there or up or down. He gives someone the plane of his face. I remember two things I'd read. One, Graves told me that Lawrence apparently never looked at anybody. He made a sort of inventory of everyone's clothes. But uh, Kennington, the sculptor who sculpted him a lot and did all the um, illustrations for Seven Pillars, said this remarkable thing which I'd never understood before which was that Lawrence reminded him of a middleweight boxer. And at that moment, something very important clicked. And uh, I knew exactly what Abdi meant by the plane of his face, which was this. And the eyes didn't travel over the, the clothes, but they were aware of the hand and aware of everything that was going on. And it was at once withdrawn, as a boxer must be, and at the same time very penetrating. And this one physical thing really clicked, and it made a whole difference to the way I played it. Now, this is the way I work. I yes. can't work with a yes. sort of exact science to me. Yes. What about his height, Peter? He was a very short man, and you're a very tall man. Do you make any effort as an actor to think like a small man? No, uh, no, no. Uh, I've always said when anyone asks me about Lawrence and Lynch's, I always say it's a question for his tailor, not his interpreter, and that's probably a bit flip. But there's nothing I can do. I don't think it's really all that important anyway. And I'm certainly sure he never thought of a small man. Hmm. And I happen to be eight foot five, as you clearly implied, yes. and uh, I can't chop off my legs and roam around on bloody stumps, so I really have had to disregard it. Do you think his being small um, affected his character? Well, I don't think it had a great effect. I mean, I know lots of small men who have not gone around the bend. And, uh, mine, uh, I think it did have an effect. Uh, when he was in England, um, a certain, I mean, very strong man, you know, could hold a rifle by the business end for 60 seconds. Good evening, with straight arms. And he was very conscious of this physical thing. But out there, don't forget the Bedouins are tutti little things. Yes. I mean, they're five foot five. Yes. Little thin things you could appear to snap. Now, he, amongst them, would have been an inch taller. Yes, yes. Yes. Which, again, ties up with this marvelous sense of relief you must have felt mm. out there. Mm. These experiences that you had from people who knew him and uh, the extraordinary things you've seen, have they in themselves deepened your knowledge of Lawrence? 
Oh, yes. Um, the desert, I think, primarily. I remember before I went to the desert, um, uh, someone told me that, um, I mean, desert, the desert is where God was born. Um, literally, one is so alone there. Um, and this man told me that uh, uh, the desert is so implacable and so indefatigable, nothing that a man can do, and that this gives one a kind of peace. And I had uh, thoughts of this very lonely, very lonely, tormented gentleman, super cerebral old thing that he was, arriving in the desert and finding his peace. Well, I got there, and I found, for my money anyway, that indeed what happens is, it is, as I say, um, so vast and unremittingly hard, that you can't win, and you know you can't win, and then you have a go. And this implies a great deal of strange things, maybe masochistic, which I think he felt. What about this fetish of cleanliness? You're not all that fussy yourself, so what do you think of it? Um, cleanliness is next to godliness, I think. A nice little rule he learned from his very, very strict mum. Hmm. And also, um, a psychiatrist told me he evidenced in Shakespeare quite a lot, the Scottish play, for instance. Hmm. Guilt. The hands never come clean and all that. Mm. And he loved the desert. He used to say it was clean. It was clean. What were some of the things that you heard and read that were important to you about deciding you which way you were going to go? Oh, there's so many, many things. Um, I remember speaking to a sheikh in Amman. It's the first Arab I met who knew him. And uh, I'd given up asking questions like, what was he like, like, how was it? I'd, I used to try sort of tricky things. And I said to him, did he ever tell jokes? At which point he went into a great stream of Arabic with tears trickling down his face, laughing like a drain. Now, I had the faintest idea what he said, but clearly Lawrence had been very, 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 very funny at one point. And I kept on finding more and more evidence of this. He was a great humorist. Mm. And, um, uh, one of them told me about the time that he questioned him for hours about the camel grazing in Piccadilly. And Lawrence gave very solemn replies to all this, whether Oxfordshire was a desert country. And then again, um, on another level, um, his descriptions of some of the things in, in Seven Pillars he did, like the killing of a man, the execution of a man. He had to execute him to keep two tribes from warring with each other and would split up a whole thing and ruin the whole adventure. So he chose, because he had no tribe, and wouldn't offend anybody, to shoot the man. He described it very coldly in um, Seven Pillars. Now, I met a man who was with him when he did it, and um, said that indeed he did do it very coldly, very methodically, and it was rather terrible, because the man was down a well and he kept on missing. And then he went out for a drive in the desert afterwards, and went for a walk, and this man was very worried about him, went to look for him, and found him behind a rock, crouched like a two-year-old baby in the most terrible state of emotion. Now that could color my killing of this man in the film. Of course. I could imply what would happen afterwards, mm. Mm. without stating. Since films are makers rather than breakers of myths, and particularly perhaps big films shot on this scale, I don't suppose this one will give us a definitive view of Lawrence any more than all the books and biographies before it had done. But it seems likely that David Lean and O'Toole between them will throw some pretty hard light on the enigmatic figure of Lawrence of Arabia, and that O'Toole will add his own highly individual and possibly memorable 
stamp to the legend.